will be some feather hormones released to go and uh, uh, target the ovaries. Okay, and then from the ovaries, there are uh, hormones which feed back this axis negatively uh, on the pituitary as well as on the hypothalamus. Now, these hormones, they control the menstrual cycle. These hormones, we'll discuss them, they control the menstrual cycle. So now you can just say that uh, uh, the, um, the menses or periods are an external manifestation of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. Okay? Uh, that is what we can see from outside. Okay? So from outside, we can see that a woman is, is having menses. Okay? But in the body, we know that there are hormones which control that uh, uh, menstrual cycles. Okay? And uh, that's why when it comes to uh, counting the months or weeks of a pregnant woman, we refer to the last normal menstrual period because that's what we can see. Okay? In the actual sense, we are supposed to start counting the weeks or months at the time of fertilization, when the ovum met the, uh, the sperm cell, when there was fertilization. That's the actual time to start counting, okay, in, uh, of course, in embryology. But when it comes to clinical practice, because you can't predict uh, when or can't say no fertilization took place on day uh, 14 or on the fifth day of uh, February and so on, you can't know. So that's why you have to refer to the last period as that is the time for the external manifestation that you can see. Yes, sir? Uh, yes, sir. What do you mean by axis? Axis, okay. Maybe I project that. So, um, the axis, so as we can see from there, so that is the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, meaning it's an act, it, 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 uh, it's like a cycle, okay? Yeah, so we have uh, the hypothalamus there, uh, where we can see there is that hormone, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, okay, coming from the hypothalamus, positively feedbacking the anterior pituitary, so that the anterior pituitary releases those two hormones, FSH, that's follicle stimulating hormone, and uh, LH, that's luteinizing hormone. Then those hormones, now they act on the ovaries, specifically the ovarian follicles, we are coming to that. And then from the follicles, okay, uh, they are recruited to grow and uh, they will be releasing hormones and so on. Then we can see there are various hormones now that uh, goes to negatively feedback on the uh, uh, pituitary as well as hypothalamus. Okay? Yeah. So that's an axis, basically. Yeah. Okay, so now, uh, having defined uh, uh, the menstrual cycle, we need to look at the components of... Yes, madam? Yes, uh, I've been wondering what happens to the unfertilized egg. Ah, okay. So what happens to the unfertilized egg when there is no fertilization? Who can answer that one? Yes, sir. Yeah, so basically it degenerates and dies within 24, 48 hours, it dies. And then it's absorbed by the by the body system, yeah. Just like the sperm cells as well, once deposited, uh, they enter the genital tract and later on they'll be absorbed as proteins in the body. <laughs> 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 All right, we are coming to that. Uh, so let's go back to, uh, to the components of the menstrual cycle. So there's a slide I've uh, added uh, uh, before this one. So we need to know that the menstrual cycle, the menstrual cycle 
uh, involves two cycles. Involves two cycles. There is a cycle in the ovary as well as a cycle in the uterus. So hence we, are, we have two cycles, ovarian cycle and uterine cycle. So the normal menstrual cycle has got these two components, the cycle in the ovary as well as the cycle in the uterus. Okay. So let's take note of that. I think it is not in, uh, in this presentation, but we need to know that the menstrual cycle, two cycles, ovarian cycle and uh, uterine cycle. So if you have been asked to discuss the uh, menstrual cycle, the normal menstrual cycle, you are expected to discuss these two cycles, the cycle in the uh, ovary as well as the cycle in the uterus, the endometrium is specific. Now, having said that, uh, therefore, we'll start with the ovarian cycle, ovarian cycle. <coughs> So the ovarian cycle has got three phases, uh, two phases, sorry, two phases. The ovarian cycle has got two phases. The first phase is what we call the follicular phase, follicular phase. And then the second phase is the luteal phase luteal phase luteal l u t e a l luteal phase so those are the two phases in the ovaries okay so they complete the cycle so follicular phase then from follicular you go to luteal luteal back to follicular follicular just like that now we need to discuss what happens in the follicular phase. What happens in the follicular phase? So in the follicular phase, here as the name suggests, there is recruitment. There is recruitment and development of ovarian follicles. So in the ovary, you are going to find ovarian follicles. Ovarian follicles contain ova, which are the eggs. Contain ova, which are the eggs. Okay. Now there are different stages of uh, ovarian follicles. There are different stages of ovarian follicles. A baby girl is born with ovarian follicles at birth okay and those follicles are in the primordial state primordial ovarian follicles okay primordial ovarian follicles so from primordial they have to uh, grow to maturity they have to grow to maturity okay and uh, we can see there that from primordial you go to the primary ovarian follicles primary ovarian follicles and then from primary you go to secondary ovarian follicles secondary ovarian follicles and then from uh, secondary ovarian follicles you go to uh, tertiary tertiary ovarian follicles or mature ovarian follicles you can also call mature ovarian follicles or graphian follicles Graphian ovarian follicles. The secondary you can also refer to them as antro, antro ovarian follicles because they have an antra. Uh, that's the first time the antra appears in the follicle, that space there containing fluid. So, what I'm trying to say is that in the follicular phase, every month there is recruitment of about 15 to 20 ovarian follicles from the uh, original pool. Okay? By the time um, uh, a girl reaches puberty, by the time the girl reaches puberty, uh, then that is the time now there will be recruitment of ovarian follicles. Okay? Be maybe around 400,000 by that time. And then every month there will be ovulation okay uh, of an egg 
mature age that is but for for you to have that mature age there is a recruitment of about 15 to 20 ovarian follicles each month but only one grows to maturity only one grows to maturity for ovulation to take place did we get that so meaning that in the uh, in the entire reproductive age uh, maybe about 500 or less will be ovulated the entire period from the uh, you can see maybe from about 400,000 somewhere okay so um, in simple terms follicular phase is a phase in the ovary where there is recruitment and development of ovarian follicles uh, to reach maturity so that one of them ovulates so that one of them ovulates from the pool so it's like having a pool let's say for simple explanations let's say in the ovary you have uh, 500 uh, ovarian follicles then every month we get 15 about 15 to 20 from that 500 those are the ones which will be programmed to grow to maturity but not all reaches maturity only one reaches maturity okay the rest what happens to the rest uh, let's say out of 18 you have one that reaches maturity what happens to the 17 they die isn't it so they degenerate they become atretic what they call at at atresia so they become atretic they die only one reaches maturity and that's the one that will be the mature uh, graphian follicle you can see from there okay ready for ovulation ready for ovulation yes madam no meaning what come again apoptosis yes, yes, yes. so they die yes so they program cell death for, uh, because there is no much stimulation uh, and so they they die so now um, what controls the follicular phase what controls the follicular phase is a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone follicle stimulating hormone fsh so fsh comes from the anterior pituitary gland and then it goes to act on the ovaries okay so that it uh, recruits about that uh, number of uh, ovarian follicles 15 to 20 to make them grow from primordial all the way up to uh, graphian stage all the way up to graphian stage so you are expected to know which hormone is responsible for this recruitment and development of the ovarian follicles in the ovary every month so fsh that's why it's called follicle stimulating hormone because it stimulates the ovary uh, stimulates the ovarian follicles to grow to maturity from primordial uh, to maturity of course at this stage we we are not going to discuss exactly uh, the cell stage inside uh, the primordial ovarian follicle okay the primary ovarian follicle and so on we have what we call primordial uh, gem cells primordial gem cells to primary oocytes primary to secondary oocytes we are not going to discuss that at this stage we'll discuss that under gametogenesis yes yes uh, sir <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we don't know why uh, it is like that, but um, um, like you have suggested, maybe it's the issue of probability and so on. So it's uh, actually uh, some form of a wasteful process. It's a wasteful process. Why have 20 but only one uh, reaches maturity? It's the same, even in waste in man. Okay, in man, uh, you know, uh, millions of sperm cells, okay, are, uh, are released, okay, during ejaculation, okay, maybe uh, 
Uh, what's the normal sperm cell count? Who knows? Per meal, you expect at least what number of sperm cells? Per meal. <laughs> greater than 20 million. Okay, so greater than 20 million per meal. That's the expected uh, sperm count, the normal sperm count. Now, uh, one injaculate, uh, you know, can be maybe two to five minutes of uh, uh, semen. Okay, so it means you multiply now by the 20 million per meal. So it is three meals, three by 20, 60 million spells. But only one who fertilize the, the egg. So you see how wasted it is. So maybe the issue of probability and so on. Okay, yeah. So uh, that's that. So let's know the follicular phase. The follicular phase. So basically, it's about recruitment of uh, the ovarian follicles for them to grow and reach maturity so that ovulation takes place. The hormone responsible is FSH. Now, as this process is taking place, another key point is that as this process of recruitment and development of the ovarian follicles is taking place, they are releasing uh, mainly estrogen. They are releasing mainly estrogen. Estrogen is a hormone, and this hormone is important now to go and um, act on the uterus, the endometrium. So estrogen will be released from these developing follicles. It will be in abundance, it will increase in levels. Uh, uh, the idea is that it needs to prepare the endometrium for possible implantation of a blastocyst. Okay? So it's a hormone that prepares the ground for implantation to take place. We get the point? So it's like you are preparing land, uh, anticipating, you know, uh, rains to come. You can't just go and uh, plant maize uh, uh, on land that you haven't prepared. So you, have, you need to cultivate and so on, dig, make the land soft, put manure, and then you add water so that you plant the maize and they germinate. That's exactly what happens with estrogen. Estrogen prepares the endometrium for implantation. Yes. yes. How exactly does it prepare for implantation? How exactly does it? Yeah, so it, it, it's a hormone, remember? So a hormone is a chemical messenger. It has a message uh, that it is carrying. So when it goes to the receptors on the endometrium, uh, the uterus endometrium will respond according to the uh, information it's carrying. So the information that estrogen is carrying to the endometrium is to make the epithelium grow, proliferate, okay, to proliferate. So the cells will increase in number, uh, a process we call, uh, what we call that process, where the cells increase in number, not size, but increasing in number. We did the epithelial tissue. An increase in the cell number, yes sir, come again, hyperplasia, okay, hyperplasia. So there will be hyperplasia of the uh, endometrium. So the cells are going to increase rapidly to increase the thickness of the endometrium. At the same point, these cells will release uh, uh, mucus around uh, the endometrium okay and also we'll stop glycogen okay there will be what we call uh, now <coughs> we'll come to that i think we'll, that's in the uh, uterine cycle we'll come to that so first let's exhaust the ovarian cycle otherwise people will get confused okay so any questions on the follicular phase follicular phase in the ovary yes sir Okay, good question. Yeah, so uh, in the ovary, 
Okay, the one which is, uh, uh, is which is specific in terms of duration is the luteal phase. The luteal phase, but the follicular phase varies. The follicular phase varies from one individual to another individual. But the luteal phase uh, is specific uh, for how many days? Who knows? Yes, sir. 14 days, yes. So 14 days. And this luteal phase, uh, maybe, uh, do we still have questions on follicular? We move to luteal phase. Yes, sir. Huh? No, no, no. Only one follicle reaches maturity. Mm. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, good question again. Yeah, so there is a possibility of uh, uh, more than one ovarian follicle reaching mature stage. Reaching mature stage. For instance, in multiple pregnancies, in multiple pregnancies like, uh, you know, twins, okay, triplets, quadruplets, and so on. Okay, so you can have more than one reaching maturity, but that's an abnormality, so to say, because under normal circumstances, you expect only one. So if you're going to have more than one, it's, it's an abnormal. It's Multiple an abnormal. pregnancy is not a normal pregnancy. It, uh, it is a high-risk pregnancy, okay, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not a normal pregnancy. The normal pregnancy is supposed to be single to one uh, fetus, one embryo, one fetus. Okay. Now, if you bring in multiple pregnancies, then now you start looking at the risk factors that could have contributed uh, for this person to have more than one follicle reaching uh, maturity. Okay. So you bring in risk factors such as what? who knows uh, who can give ideas of you know risk factors to multiple pregnancies. Is the hand to answer the question, or it's another question? Uh, first, yes, 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 sir. No, 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 I mean the risk factors. What what can contribute in causing uh, more than one follicle reaching maturity? Yes, ma'am. Uh, birth control. Birth control is like you are preventing, uh, you know, ovulation. Okay? So maybe if you said uh, stimulating ovulation, so there are drugs we use to stimulate ovulation in infertility, okay, in someone who is not uh, conceiving and so on, maybe because of lack of ovulation, you can use a drug such as clomiphene to stimulate the uh, woman to ovulate, but that stimulation will stimulate in more, more ovarian follicles than the usual 15 to 20, so you end up having more uh, you know, ovarian follicles reaching maturity and later on uh, being fertilized, resulting in multiple pregnancies. So yes, that one. Also, uh, simple things like uh, family history. Okay, if in the family, especially which side, materno or paterno? Materno. So materno side, if there is a history of multiple pregnancies, then it's a risk factor to contribute to. Uh, that uh, multiple pregnancy or uh, race, okay, uh, race uh, region, for instance, in Africa, West Africa, higher chance of uh, multiple pregnancy, okay, and so on. So, uh, assisted reproductive techniques, okay, the same uh, uh, where you want to make a woman, uh, you know, conceive, and so on. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, yeah, so it can happen also where uh, none of them matures uh, or let alone being ovulated, but one ends up having menses. We have what we call unovulatory cycles, unovulatory cycles. You have a cycle, but uh, no, uh, no, no egg being ovulated from the ovary. For instance, lactating mothers, mothers who are breastfeeding, okay, uh, after the third month and so on, they can have some menses. But those menses, most likely they are unovulated uh, cycles because there is no 
egg uh, coming out from the ovary, okay, because of high level of prolactin. Okay, yeah, now the question is <laughs> okay, that one should be the last, then we move on to load two phase. Yes, ma'am. As what? Folic acid. On the menstrual side? No, no. So folic acid, we use it uh, uh, to prevent uh, uh, neural tube defects, uh, such as, you know, uh, anencephaly, spinal bifida, those uh, where you don't want uh, defects to do with the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, I think let's move on to luteal phase. So luteal phase starts at the day of ovulation. Luteal phase starts at the day of ovulation. So once ovulation takes place, the ovum comes out from the follicle, from the graphian follicle. Uh, the remaining structure, the remaining structure in the Forico is called what? Yes, sir. Corpus luteum. Very good. Corpus luteum. So the remaining structure in the uh, uh, forico is the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum. Corpus is what? What do we what do you, what do we mean by corpus? Corpus. Corpus means. Yes, sir. Body, good. So corpus means body. Okay, you can see people are studying now. Huh? They have been motivated. <laughs> yeah. So corpus means body. So body of luteum. So this uh, corpus luteum is the structure that will remain in the uh, in the ovary once the egg comes out from the ovarian uh, follicle, the mature ovarian follicle. We are going to have luteal cells luteal cells which are yellowish and so on and they will release uh, a hormone called what progesterone progesterone so take note of the hormone here in the follicular phase uh, emphasis was on the estrogen coming out from the follicles this time from the corpus luteum it's progesterone progesterone okay yeah so uh, once ovulation takes place, corpus luteum uh, uh, remains in the ovary, releasing progesterone. Releasing progesterone. What's the role of progesterone? Yes, sir. Yes, very good. So progesterone maintains the lining of the endometrium at endometrium so that it doesn't shed off as lenses. So it maintains the integrity of the uh, endometrium so that it remains intact in readiness for implantation and later on uh, maintaining the pregnancy once implantation has taken place. Now without progesterone it means that the endometrium will be, you know, will degenerate it will degenerate and break, and then uh, the endometrium, uh, the functional layer of the endometrium, will shed off as menses because there is no enough progesterone to maintain it. Okay, so please, we need to the functions of these hormones: uh, FSH, estrogen. Now we are on progesterone. So. Um, yeah, so that is progesterone. So progesterone is going to maintain the endometrium uh, as it waits for implantation to take place. If there is no fertilization, if there is no fertilization, it means that uh, the corpus luteum will degenerate and die and become, to become what? Yes, sir. Corpus albicans. Good. So, if there is no fertilization, the corpus luteum degenerates, dies, and becomes corpus albicans. Corpus albicans. Basically, uh, a fibrous tissue. 
the fibrous tissue that is not releasing hormones. So no more progesterone. And if there is no progesterone, then it, like I said, the endometrium will shed off as menses. Okay? So it means there is no pregnancy. Now, if there is a pregnancy, if there is a fertilization, okay, what will happen? What will happen? Yes, sir. Okay, very good, very good. Yeah, so if there is fertilization, okay, as we know, fertilization is fusion of the sperm cell and egg cell to form a zygote. A zygote is a one cell structure. It divides by cleavage uh, to increase the cell, the cell number from one, two, two, four, four, eight, eight, sixteen, molar stage, and so on. Okay, now. That conceptus, we call it a conceptus. The conceptus once formed, uh, it's going to release another hormone, which we call, like he has uh, mentioned, beta human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. Beta human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, uh, abbreviated beta HCG abbreviated beta hcg okay so that's the hormone that comes out from the conceptus to be specific to be specific the conceptus has initially uh, the outer cell mass and an inner cell mass it is the outer cell uh, outer cell mass programmed to form the placenta that releases uh, beta hcg uh, what we call the trophoblast, trophoblast. So the trophoblast tissue, trophoblast tissue, to be specific, the syncytial trophoblast releases beta HCG. This hormone uh, goes to, you know, to prolong the lifespan of the corpus luteum so that it doesn't degenerate within 14 days. Remember that if no fertilization, the corpus luteum after day 14, it dies. So that's why that luteal phase is programmed to be uh, 40 days. Luteal phase is 14 days. Because of the corpus luteum, that has a lifespan of about 10 to 14 days. Okay? So, um, so that's what happens. So now the Corpus luteum, since there is a fertilization, pregnancy is there, so it means that the corpus luteum will not degenerate at day 14. Its lifespan will be prolonged beyond the 14 days, and it can actually go as, uh, uh, as to maybe about four to five months of pregnancy. Okay, so four to five months. Okay. Uh, why? It's because now at that time uh, the placenta is fully formed. The placenta is fully formed to release its own progesterone. Remember the, the role of corpus luteum is to release progesterone. Progesterone to maintain the endometrium, to maintain the pregnancy. So if uh, corpus luteum dies early, even in pregnancy, you end up losing the, the, the pregnancy. And those are the miscarriages. Some of the causes of uh, miscarriages is corpus luteum insufficiency. Corpus luteum insufficiency. When one is pregnant, but the corpus luteum does not go beyond 14 days, despite uh, uh, being pregnant. It go beyond 14 days, but maybe just for a few days, and then it dies. Okay, those are the early miscarriages at around maybe three weeks of being pregnant, four months, uh, basically first trimester miscarriages. Some of them could be because of uh, corpus luteum insufficiency. Okay, and uh, we usually uh, diagnose this by looking at the history of the woman. Why is it that every time the woman gets pregnant, at week three, she loses the pregnancy? 
Okay, she lost in 20, uh, 2019, again 2020, same period, 2021, same period. It could be because of the corpus luteum insufficiency. So you have to supplement by giving exogenous progesterone to prolong the, uh, the pregnancy until the placenta is formed. And that's why we give those uh, micronized, micronized progesterone. Okay. Yes, madam. When you take an abortion pill or morning after pill, how Come do again. You, when you take an abortion pill yes. or morning after pill, uh -huh. What exactly happens? What uh, part of the... Uh, okay. Does it affect? All right. Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, when one takes a uh, morning pill, you know, or one takes uh, a potion pill, what exactly happens? Okay. So, I'll take it back to the audience. So, which pill are we talking about when we say an abortion pill? Which pill is this? Yes, madam. It should be the name. Not really. Not really. Not misoprostol. Yes, misoprostol can be used uh, in a potion, but it's not an abortifacient drug. It's not a drug to abort a pregnancy. So we, we, yeah. So the drug is mifepristone, mifepristone, M-I-F-E-P-R-I-S-T-O-N-E, mifepristone, that's the drug. Now, what is the mechanism of action of this drug? So what this drug does is that it goes to bind on the uh, progesterone receptors on the endometrium, okay, on the endometrium, so that by the drug binding there, progesterone will not find a place where it should bind on the endometrium. Okay, so something like uh, uh, competitive inhibition, what we call competitive inhibition. So the drug goes to bind first before the hormone binds there. So that when the hormone comes to the endometrium, there is already a drug, so it won't bind. And by blocking progesterone, remember, the, bot, the endometrium will sense that there is no progesterone, no corpus luteum, so the pregnancy will, uh, will come out, okay, because the endometrium will, will break down, it will be degeneration and it will break down. Now, that is uh, mifepristone, so mifepristone its job is to just break down the endometrium so that it sheds off together with the pregnancy. But misoprostol is to flush out now whatever contents are in the endometrial cavity so that uh, things come out. That's miso, uh, misoprostol. Okay. Yeah. Now when you take a morning pill, a morning pill is not a, a drug for abortion. A morning pill uh, there as an emergence contraceptive pill, okay, where you are trying to prevent an intended pregnancy. So when you take it, you are basically blocking ovulation. Okay, that's why it has to be taken within a specified period, which is, uh, which is what? <laughs> <laughs> These are two life situations. Eh? So within three days, 72 hours, uh, the pill has to be taken. Beyond that, if you are going to use an emergency pill, it won't work out. Yeah. Okay, we move on uh, uh, with our discussion. Uh, time, time. We need to finish. Otherwise, we won't finish. <laughs> yes, madam. The last one for now. Uh, despite being preg uh, despite not being pregnant, that's a uh, pathology. It's uh, an abnormality. So maybe the body is releasing too much estrogen, okay, abnormally, and then that's the one now that acts on the endometrium to increase its thickness. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, especially risk factors such as uh, those with obesity, okay, they have high level of estrogen in the body because uh, 
there is conversion of androgens in the fat tissue to uh, estrogen. And then this estrogen goes to act on the endometrium and increase its thickness despite someone not being pregnant. We call that endometrial hyperplasia, okay, which is a very risky uh, factor for endometrial cancer. One can develop endometrial cancer uh, because of that. Okay, so uh, especially postmenopausal uh, uh, patients, they they have such, okay, and they are at high risk. So uh, if a woman stopped menses, uh, but later on starts to bleed again, it could be endometrial hyperplasia, or it could be endometrial cancer. Uh, those are the things to look out for, especially cancer. Okay. I think we move on. Yeah, so we are on the road to phase, to phase. How far did we go? We just said that the road to phase starts at the day of ovulation, where you have a corpus luteum pro, uh, producing progesterone. Progesterone goes to bind on the endometrium, you know, uh, maintaining the endometrium in readiness for implantation to take place. Now, why is it called luteal phase? It's because of the corpus luteum. That's why we're calling it luteal phase. Uh, like we had the follicular phase because of the follicles that have been recruited to grow. This one we're calling it luteal phase because there's a corpus luteum. Okay, corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum, if there is fertilization, when there is pregnancy, uh, we call it corpus luteum of pregnancy. Corpus luteum of pregnancy. Now, one thing I didn't highlight is uh, the beta HCG hormone. That beta HCG hormone, remember, it's coming from the conceptors, from the conceptors, meaning that someone is pregnant. So, under normal circumstances, under physiological uh, circumstances, uh, uh, a, a woman should not have beta HCG in the body. So the moment you detect beta HCG in the body of a woman, okay, uh, uh, in the reproductive age, that one equals pregnancy until pro proven otherwise, okay, until proven otherwise, because it normally comes from the conceptors, from the conceptors. So it means that that woman is pregnant until proven otherwise. So how can you? Uh, detect this uh, hormone. So you can detect it either in blood or in urine. We normally use uh, urine because urine, you don't need to prick someone uh, to cause pain on someone. So you just ask uh, for urine. Someone goes to urinate, gives urine, and then you uh, test for the hormone, uh, beta HCG. If that hormone is detected, it means pregnant until proven otherwise. Okay? That's, uh, so it is a hormone on which we base the pregnancy test. So that pregnancy test, the Grav index, Grav index or pregnancy test, okay, we base it, we base it on beta HCG detection. In blood, it is uh, area detected compared to urine because in urine, uh, first of all, the hormone has to accumulate in the body uh, until such a situation where the hormone now starts coming out in urine. Okay, so if you use blood, you may detect the pregnancy much area compared to using urine. Okay, so please take note: uh, beta HCG is the hormone uh, of pregnancy. Now, in those who are not pregnant and then you detect beta HCG, it could be maybe a tumor, a tumor of cancer releasing uh, this beta HCG. But under normal circumstances, we don't expect beta HCG to be released in the body uh, uh, unless there is pregnancy. Okay, so that's that. So let's know where beta HCG comes from and its function. Okay, so beta HCG comes from trophoblastic tissue, to be specific, syncytial trophoblast, and this syncytial trophoblast uh, releases uh, this hormone so that the hormone goes to prolong the lifespan of the corpus luteum beyond the 14 days so that it can continue secreting progesterone to maintain the pregnancy. 
Okay, otherwise, uh, 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 yeah, yes. Come again. Is what? Oh, for <laughs> uh, S Y S Y N uh, T I O. Same, same two. Yeah, so S S Y N C Y T I O then T R O uh, P H A P H O sorry P H O Pro Four Blast B L A S T So since Pro Four Blast Okay so that's the loot you face Okay, in the over. So let's, uh, okay, I'll come uh, to your question. So the follicular phase, remember I said it varies, but the root two phase is 14 days. It's programmed that one, it's 14 days. That's why you can't predict ovulation going forward. Going forward, you can't predict on which day ovulation will take place. Uh, unless you do a retrospective uh, way, you can uh, 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 you can predict when ovulation took place in the last month. In the last month. Okay, how? Is by the day of menses, when the menses come out, it means there was no fertilization. So you now start counting backwards, two weeks backwards. That's the day of duration to place for that cycle. Okay? But you can't predict going forward. Of course, there will be these uh, uh, predicting factors, uh, survival, you know, what, what, uh, temperature, and so on. But you can't really predict exactly on which day of duration will take place. Okay? So I think those are the main points in the ovarian cycle. Main points in the ovarian cycle. Now we we'll go to the uterine cycle. <laughs> so many questions, but we have to look at time also. <laughs> so we are here up to 13 hours, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so uh, time is not with us. So let's uh, just hold on to your questions. Let's the uterine cycle. Uterine cycle. So uterine cycle, so this is the cycle that takes place in the endometrium of the uterus. The uterus, we need to know that the uterus, in layman, we call it the womb, okay, womb, and, uh, uh, you know, we can also call it hystera, hystera, in, is it Latin or Greek? So hystera. Hysteria from which we get the adjective hysterectomy. So if we say hysterectomy is basically removal of the uterus. So what is the function of the uterus? What's the function of the uterus? Anyone? It's an organ in which <laughs> we don't know what's the role of the uterus so basically it's an organ in which uh, the embryo fetus develops isn't it? Uh, it provides an environment for the baby to develop inside okay so it provides that environment Okay, for the uh, uh, embryo fetus to develop. Okay? That's the main function of the uterus. And that's why a woman who does not have a uterus, obviously, cannot uh, uh, get pregnant. Okay. Cannot get pregnant because there is no uterus. But it doesn't mean that that person cannot uh, have her own children our own children. <laughs> yes, how? Someone no uterus. Okay? But can have 
her own real children. How? Yes, uh, madam. Yes, surrogacy. Okay, so uh, certain countries, uh, they allow surrogacy. Okay, surrogacy is a situation where uh, in this particular case, uh, where there is no uterus, but the ovaries are there and the eggs are there, okay? You get the eggs from the from the woman, okay? And then you get the sperm cells from the uh, husband and uh, you fertilize in the, uh, in the laboratory, okay? Uh, basically, in vitro fertilization. Once there is uh, the embryos, okay, those embryos now you can implant them uh, uh, in another woman's uh, uterus. Okay? And then development takes place until that woman delivers. One woman delivers, takes the baby to the uh, couple. Yeah. Yeah. So that happens. That happens. Of course, yeah, there are laws governing surrogates. Okay? There are laws governing surrogates. And uh, some of the laws are that. Uh, uh, you know, the couple should take responsibility of uh, that baby, okay? If the couple along the way cannot provide, you know, basic requirements for the baby, for the child, okay? Uh, the law is in such a way that uh, the child can be taken back to the woman who, uh, you know, who has the uterus. I mean, who provided the environment for the development of that child. And now it becomes that woman's child. Yes, madam. Yes, possible. Yes, it depends with the number of uh, embryos you are going to uh, implant. Yes, sir. Come again. I can't get the, I can't get the question, sorry. Maybe someone can. Did I see Jehovah? Yes. Did I see? No, no, no. Fibroids, they don't release a bit of CG. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, so I think let's progress. Yes, one. definitely they want okay so if a woman does not have a uterus there will be no menses no menses you know there is no endometrium okay no endometrium okay so uh, such individuals are there okay uh, once in a while uh, though rare but we, uh, we, we see such patients uh, patients coming uh, with uh, infertility, primary infertility, they can't conceive. You do investigations, you find that actually uh, the uterus is absent. Okay, no uterus, no tubes, no upper vagina. Okay, so uh, we call that uh, Murarian agenesis. The Murarian system did not develop. Okay, uh, so there are no fallopian tubes. There, are, there, there is no uterus and. Uh, the upper part of the vagina is not there. It's just as, uh, the lower part of the vagina because the lower part comes from a different source during development. Okay. So, that's that. Yes, yes. Sir. What, what causes some women to menstruate even after, uh, after becoming pregnant? What causes? Some women to menstruate even after becoming pregnant. After becoming pregnant, no, no, that's not menses. It's in spotting. So in spotting, the pregnancy is uh, uh, maybe trying to uh, come out, uh, threatening abortion. So those are miscarriages. Okay, we move on. Yeah. So in the uterus, so we need to know the layers of the uterus. We have the innermost layer, endometrium. The middle layer, what we call the middle layer. Myometria, myometria, and then the outermost layer, perimetria, perimetria. So these are the layers of the uterus. So endometria, myometria, perimetria. 
the endometrium of the uterus is the one we are interested in. The myometrium is basically a, a very thick muscle layer, it's a smooth muscle layer of the uterus, and then the perimetrium, the serosa uh, adventitia. Okay? But the endometrium is the one we are interested in. Now, the endometrium uh, has got two layers. We have what we call the functional layer of the endometrium and uh, the basal layer of the endometrium. So functional versus basal. The, the functional having two sub-layers, the compact and the spongy. Okay, compact and spongy. Uh, it seems our projection has a problem. Should have shown the diagrams. Yeah, so we have a functional layer and a basal layer. The functional layer is on top, the basal layer being the basal base. Is that the base? So during menses, what actually sheds off is the functional layer. That one we have in the compact and uh, uh, the, uh, the sponge. Okay? So it's a functional layer that come, comes out. The basal layer remains intact. The basal layer remains intact. It has stem cells uh, to provide the regeneration for the next cycle. Okay, remember one of the characteristics of epithelial tissue is that it regenerates. So how does an endometrium regenerate? So it's by having uh, stem cells in the basal uh, layer. Okay, so uh, we can see that. Okay, so we can say so I mean we can see the basal layer and the spongy layer of the endometrium. Now there's the spongy, then we have the compact layer. Those two they form the functional layer, functional layer of the endometrium. So that's the one which sheds off during menses. We can see from day zero to about four to five days, there where it says basal layer, okay, so there's a, a gap there, and then it starts to increase in thickness as you approach day 14 and beyond, okay. So the functional layer sheds off during menses. The basal layer remains intact to provide stem cells for regeneration uh, of the endometrium in readiness for the next cycle. Okay, so that's that. So now let's look at the phases in the uterine cycle. Just like we did for the ovarian cycle, what about the uterine cycle? What are the phases? So in the uterine cycle, we have three phases, three phases. Number one, menstrual phase, menstrual phase. Number two, proliferative, proliferative phase, proliferative phase. And then number three, secretory phase, secretory phase. So these are the phases in the uterine cycle. Now we need to know that we need to know that the secretory phase, the secretory phase in the uterus coincides with the which which phase in the ovarian? In the ovarian, the luteal phase. Good, luteal phase. So we need to know that the secretory phase in the uterus coincides with the luteal phase in the ovary. And that's why some textbooks, they, they might use luteal phase in the uterus also, but that's somehow a misnomer uh, because we, that, that should be in the ovary. Okay. So meaning that the proliferative phase Proliferative phase is is coinciding with the which one? The follicular follicular phase in the ovary. These these cycles are taking place at the same time. 
in the ovary, in the uterus. Okay, that's why I said that the menstrual cycle, for you to discuss it fully, you have to discuss these two cycles. Ovarian cycle, uterine cycle. So if you just discuss the uterine cycle in the uterus, leaving out the ovarian, you lose a lot of marks actually. Okay, because it means it's not complete. Okay, so, yeah. Now, menstrual phase. Menstrual phase, uh, duration, normal duration, about, about, who knows, normal duration of menstrual phase. Menstrual phase, this is a phase where there is breeding, that breeding phase, where the woman is having the menses. Normally, it's supposed to be, sorry? Three to seven days, yes. So three to seven days. So if you come to the hospital and say, no, my periods are prolonged and so on, you are complaining, then we ask, ah, uh, how long did you take? Then you say, no, I took five days. That's normal. To us, that's normal. So I did three to seven days. It's okay. That's the menstrual phase. The breeding phase, three to seven days. However, in terms of the amount of blood, okay, the volume of blood in this period, okay, ideally, what's the average blood loss in this menstrual phase? Yes, ma'am. 35 mules, yes. So, 35 mules the entire duration, meaning that per day, per day, uh, okay, so per day in terms of parts, what are the, uh, you know, average number of parts uh, used per day, okay, used per day, of course, fully soaked, uh, fully soaked parts, not just, uh, you know, you have a stain, then you remove, you change, Okay, and so on. No, fully soaked, standard part. What am I asking? It's not a Yes, sir. Women, uh, I don't want to say. Come again. Three, okay? Yeah, so fair enough. Three, two, three, two, five. Why are you asking me to go Okay. <laughs> one standard part, one standard part, uh, what's the amount of blood uh, it holds? One standard part, the same hand, yes, man. come again, five mules, yes, so five mules, so five mules, one standard, huh? standard, by standard, um, I'm sure you, we know what that means. So standard part. So five mules. <coughs> any blood loss beyond eight, eight to five mules, any blood loss in this period of above eight to eight to five mules can cause, can cause what? Yes, iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia. Okay. So IDA, iron deficiency anemia. That's why those women with prolonged or heavy menses, they come with anemia, and the anemia type is iron deficiency because they are breeding, they are losing out iron out of the body. Okay. So uh, that's that. Um, so we'll come to the abnormalities to do with the. Uh, menstrual cycle will come to the uh, disorders of uh, uh, the menses, the, mes uh, the menstrual cycle. So that's the menstrual phase. So let's know the menstrual phase. Now again to emphasize the menstrual phase, day one of menses, day one of menses is uh, the day for starting to count the cycle. So the cycle it, in terms of counting, we started uh, on day one of menses.
So on day one, that's when the cycle starts. Are we together? Now, remember, we said the luteal phase programmed about 14 days, but the uh, follicular varies. The follicular varies depending on the individual. Okay, that's why we find that uh, the menstrual cycles, in terms of duration of the cycle itself, the entire cycle varies. But the average duration in women is what? The average duration. Yes, sir. 28. Come again. Okay. So average is 28 days. Average is 28 days. However, uh, the range, the range is plus or minus one week to that 28. So 28 plus or minus seven days. That means it can range from 21 to 35 days. Are we together? So the range is 21 to 35 days. Average 28. Okay. Now if you put average of 28 and you subtract 14 days to the day of ovulation, it means the follicular phase, we expect the follicular phase for someone who has 28 days because 28 day cycles to be 14 days in. What about the one who has uh, 35 days? For regular phase, if you subtract 14 from 35, that would be what? 21 days. 35 minus 14. It's 21? Yes. Okay. So 21, so meaning that you can range to, the, to that. What about someone with 21 days and you subtract 14? Seven. Seven. So you can see that the follicular phase varies. The follicular phase varies. Okay, good. So let's know that. Now if we say, when was your last normal menstrual period? When was your last normal menstrual period? Okay, most women will make a mistake. They will give the day of the last period. That's wrong. By last normal menstrual period, we mean the first day of the last cycle. The first day of the last cycle. Okay, so most women will give you the day of the last uh, day for breeding. Okay, so if a woman is pregnant, uh, then you have to ask about the last normal menstrual period because you have to calculate the weeks. Okay, so you get the day of the first, I mean the uh, day one of the menses for the last cycle. Day one of the menses for the last cycle. That's the one to get. So the way you can get that information, uh, of course, requires technique. Uh, they may not, some of them, they may not give you. So you just say, how, how many days did you take uh, in terms of breeding? You bred for how many days? You say three days. Then you subtract three from the day that they gave you as the last, uh, the last period. Subtract three, then you'll be on day one of the cycle. Yes, sir. But, uh, I think we are coming to the disorders of uh, the menses. Uh, that is what we call painful menses. What's the medical term for that? Painful menses. Dysmenorrhea. Okay, we call it dysmenorrhea. So come to that. Okay, let's just finish the, the phases. So menstrual phase, we have done. Then we go to the proliferative phase. So what are the key features in the proliferative phase in the uterus? So as the name suggests, proliferative. So it means this is a phase now where estrogen is acting on, the, um, on that endometrial lining which had shed off. 
so that now the stem cells, they regenerate other cells. They regenerate other cells to increase the thickness in readiness for implantation. So that's proliferative phase, and that's why it's called proliferative phase. And it, is, it coincides with the uh, follicular phase in the ovary. Because there, FSH is acting there to recruit the uh, ovarian follicles. As they are recruited and growing, they release estrogen. This estrogen uh, comes to uh, target the endometrium and make it proliferate and prepare uh, the endometrium for implantation. Uh, in the case of fertilization. So that's uh, in proliferative phase. You are basically replacing the functional layer of the endometrium. The one that had uh, shed off, you are replacing it in the proliferative phase. We go to the secretory phase. Secretory phase, again here, as the name suggests, secretory. It means here, uh, it means, uh, uh, let's have the projector, I mean the projection of this one. Yeah, so it means that uh, uh, in the secretory phase, okay, we can see there are other terms to use, progestational, okay, meaning before pregnancy. So in the secretory phase, what can we see here? There is an increase in the uh, thickness of the endometrium. The number two, we can see clearly that the uterine glands, the uterine glands, what type of glands are uterine glands? What type of glands are uterine glands? You did uh, granular epithelium. <coughs> In terms of morphology, yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> what type of glands? We did the granular epithelia and how to classify glands, isn't it? Yes, yes, sir. Simple columnar. No. Glands. <laughs> yes, sir. In terms of morphology, in terms of morphology, remember glands we can classify them in terms of morphology, cells, yes sir. Simple tubular glands, yes, simple tubular glands, okay, so simple tubular glands. So there is an increase in the number and uh, uh, not only the number of uterine glands but also the the, in terms of the height of the, uh, the glands, they become taller and uh, they become more tortuous, what we call tortuous. They become more tortuous, they meander. Okay? So, uh, they become more tortuous. Okay, there should be another picture for this. Yeah, so you can see here, uh, changes in uterine glands and uterine cells during the menstrual cycle. So you can see the, the various changes. So as we progress uh, to day 22, 28, we can see the uterine glands. Okay. We can see the uterine glands becoming more taller and more tortuous, uh, secreting more mucus uh, to the endometrium. Okay, in readiness for implantation. So apart from all that, in terms of this, the glands, in terms of the cells, in terms of the cells, the cells, they undergo what we call decidual changes, uh, decidual changes. So they store more glycogen, they store more glycogen. Glycogen is a form of uh, energy storage. Okay, so uh, when there is implantation of the blastocyst, initially uh, the blastocyst uh, in the early stages, uh, we know that the blastocyst does not have a secretory system. There is no secretory system there. Okay, so uh, we expect that this structure will receive glucose 
who receive oxygen uh, by diffusion from the surrounding um, uh, the surrounding endometrial tissue. So therefore, the cells that are available there should have more of this uh, glycogen to provide uh, glucose to the uh, uh, to the to, to the blastocyst. Okay. So that's why these cells in the endometrium, they need to accumulate more glycogen uh, in them okay, to provide energy by diffusion. Glycogen related to glucose, and then glucose diffuses to this uh, structure. Yeah, so those are some of the changes uh, happening in the secretory phase. Okay, so the endometrium becomes more thicker the uh, uterine glands become more taller and more tortuous and secretes more mucus. That's why it's secretory phase. And then the uh, cells, the, the cells undergo decidual changes. Decidual changes. What is a decidia? A decidia. Decidia. So the endometrium of uh, pregnancy. Endometrium of pregnancy. We call it a decidia. Decidia. Decidia, from the word decidias, decidias is to do with what? Shading. Shading, isn't it? So the endometrium sheds off. Sheds off. Just like we have decidias plants, decidias plants, uh, when it's in winter, you know, they drop the leaves. Uh, when summer comes, uh, the leaves come back. Okay, those are decidious trees. So the same way decidia is to do with shedding. Okay, so we have run through the phases, prophase, uh, proliferative phase, two phase. So you should be able to draw a well-labeled diagram to illustrate the normal menstrual cycle. So this one is the normal one. This one is the normal one. This one, which are, uh, I projected, this one there is implantation of the embryo. So there's a gravid phase, that's the pregnant, the pregnant uh, phase. Okay, but the normal one is supposed to be this one. Okay, where we have the menstrual phase, the proliferative secretory, after secretory, because there is no fertilization, shedding off again uh, comes back. Oh, I forgot to highlight uh, Again, the spiral arteries. Uh, spiral arteries. Have we seen the arteries? These are the spiral arteries. So the spiral arteries as well, in the secretory phase, in the secretory phase, they become more tortuous. More tortuous and they dilate. So they dilate and become more tortuous, basically to bring more blood from the mother to the endometrium. Okay, so that that blood can, you know, uh, provide oxygen, provide nutrients to the conceptors, okay, and then take away uh, waste products uh, from there. So please let's know the normal menstrual cycle, okay, so we expect you to know how to uh, draw or label this uh, diagram. Now coming to abnormalities, uh, menstrual disorders. There was a question? Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. How, why is it uh, impressive uh, um, in the production of uh, the mucus under the secretory phase? Oh, under secretory phase. So that mucus is to provide, uh, you know, a lubricated environment within the a uterine, a uterine cavity. Okay, imagine having no mucus there. Uh, it will be dry and, uh, you know, the environment will not be conducive for the development of the embryo and fetus. So we need that uh, uh, environment. Okay. Yeah, so mucus is, is important as a lubricator, as a lubricator in various organs in the body. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yes. So which ones are considered as safe days in the side? Oh. 
So having learnt the normal menstrual cycle, uh, we have seen clearly here, we have seen clearly from this, uh, from this cycle, so which days can be regarded as safe days? Which days? Yes, ma madam. So the first three days, depending on the side. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Five days after menstruation. Five days after menstruation. <laughs> yes, sir. Five days. This lecture can't be done without this question. It can never. Never. It would have been, would have been incomplete. predict going forward it's going backwards so you can uh, look at the pattern of your cycles uh, in terms of the days of uh, menses day one of men, uh, of the menstrual cycle and then you subtract 14 you go backwards around there that's when it is fertilization however uh, in general in general it is considered that the first eight days and the last eight days of the cycle are safe. The first eight days, including, including what? The menstrual phase. So if we say the menstrual phase is three to seven days, that seven days is in safe days. Okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's difficult. It's difficult. So you just uh, retrospect, you go backwards, but you are predicting backward, you're not predicting forward, okay? So in general, the first eight days and the last one week, because by the last one week we expect uh, you are now, uh, the corpus luteum has degenerated and uh, if there is no fertilization, shedding should do, uh, take place. Yes, yes ma'am. What happens if? In females, that menstruate more than once a month. We have a shorter menstrual cycle. What, what happens? What happens in females that menstruate more than once Oh, that menstruate more than Those are abnormalities uh, where we are coming from. But I think there was another. Uh, he asked about the, uh, and the moody issues. Huh? <laughs> yeah, the moody issues and so on. So, you want to answer that one? Okay, first, let's answer, let's answer it first. Why is it that uh, women, they have these mood, uh, mood swings around the uh, men's <laughs> <laughs> So it's to do with hormones uh, regulating the cycle. It's to do with hormones regulating the cycle. However, uh, sometimes you can have uh, some abnormalities like premenstrual syndrome. Premenstrual syndrome. Okay, that one is premenstrual syndrome. PMS is uh, a, a disorder. Okay, where a woman every time before having menses uh, has this mood swing. Okay, the mood uh, may be low and so on, depressed. 
okay, and so on and so forth. So basically more like a psychiatric uh, uh, condition. <laughs> 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 How come? With the symptoms for pregnancy. Yeah, because again it's about the hormones regulating uh, the cycles. So the hormones there, it means they are increasing. The same hormones that are also found in pregnancy, they are also in this phase when there is uh, such a thing. So the effects will be uh, essentially the same. Okay, I think there was a hand. Mm. Uh, we need to finish. We need to finish. Yes, okay. Okay, let's finish first. Let's finish. Uh, we have nine minutes. So let's finish. Um, the disorders. The menstrual disorders. So menstrual disorders, we have quite a number there. We can see abnormalities of frequency. Abnormalities of frequency. So some women, they have what we call polymenorrhea. Polymenorrhea, meaning having more frequent uh, uh, menses than usual. Remember the duration is supposed to be 21 to 35 days. But some women, they may have their cycles less than lasting, I mean um, the duration being less than 21 days. So it means if such a thing happens, in one year they are going to have multiple menses, isn't it? Quite uh, multiple menses than usual, than usual. So we call that uh, polymenorrhea. Okay? The opposite of that is oligomenorrhea, having menses in terms of duration of cycles uh, lasting more than 35 days. Okay? Imagine having uh, cycles uh, lasting more than 35. Uh, you go into the 40s, okay, after 40 days, that's when you have your period. After 45 days, you have the period. That's abnormal. And by that, it means you're going to have less than, probably less than nine cycles in a year. Okay, less than nine cycles in a year. So we call that oligomenorrhea. Okay, so you see there are maybe about four to uh, nine menstrual periods in a year. Then you have abnormalities to do with volume and duration. Okay, so uh, volume and duration of the menstrual phase. Okay, so menorrhagia, menorrhagia is having excessive breathing, heavy breathing. Now this menorrhagia can, can be in two, uh, two categories. Either you have the normal three to seven days of breathing, but you breathe more than normal. Okay, you breathe more than normal in that normal period. Okay, you have uh, volume even more than eight mules and so on. Okay, but also it can be in terms of the duration of the uh, menstrual phase being prolonged. So instead of three to seven, you end up having periods of fourteen days, one I mean two weeks. Okay, despite having uh, you know changing three to four parts a day, but the fact that you have gone beyond uh, seven days. Uh, that is prolonged menses, which basically, in terms of when you quantify the amount of blood lost, it will be more than usual, isn't it? So you end up having uh, the same menorrhagia. And then hypomenorrhea is uh, scanty menstruation, scanty menstruation, where the uh, breathing is not much, okay? Uh, breathing is not much, especially uh, when one has to do with using uh, hormonal uh, contraceptive pills, hormonal uh, family planning methods. Then others, uh, you can have amenorrhea, basically absence of menses. Uh, amenorrhea can be primary or secondary amenorrhea. Primary amenorrhea uh, is where one is not having uh, menses. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, that primary can also be physiological or pathological, okay? It can be physiological, uh, the primary one. Okay, so we expect menses, remember we said we expect menses around the, starting around the 12 to 16 years, isn't it? Yeah. Now imagine someone uh, reaches age of 20, no menses yet. Okay, no menses yet. Okay, so 
uh, amenorrhea can be primary or secondary. Uh, the primary can be physiological or pathological. The physiological is where you have, for instance, uh, uh, one is pregnant, okay, it's normal, normal state, it's just that the pers person is pregnant, so we don't expect menses, okay. Uh, maybe uh, someone has, uh, uh, or rather someone is breastfeeding during lactation also, it's physiological, isn't it? Um, the secondary one is where now you have some uh, pathologies there also, uh, you know, disrupting the, uh, that axis, okay, disrupting the axis. So, upset of menses in general basically means the uh, amenorrhea. Then, metrorrhagia is where you have intermenstrual bleeding, that one where someone was trying to say that uh, someone uh, uh, you know, breeds, but then again, two weeks later, maybe breeds, okay? Uh, so that is metrorrhagia. That is uh, metrorrhagia. Instead of having one breeding episode in a cycle, you have more than one, okay? Okay? So intermenstrual breeding, breakthrough breeding or prolonged menstruation at irregular intervals, irregular intervals. By regular cycles, we mean cycles which come uh, every month. Every month you have uh, cycles, you have uh, 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 menses, okay? Those are considered regular. They don't really need to be on exactly on the same day, no? They can be delayed maybe by one or two days, okay? But as long as in a cycle you you have the menses, that's, those are regular cycles, regular cycles. Irregular is where you are skipping some, some months. Then menometrorrhagia, there's both menorrhagia and metrorrhagia. Dysmenorrhea, oh, that's uh, painful menses, painful menses. Again, it can be primary or secondary uh, dysmenorrhea, okay? Uh, here is not the usual pain that, uh, you know, some may complain. This is severe pain, severe pain that will affect your social life, will affect your daily activities, okay? Even coming to class, you miss class because you're having these very painful menses, okay? So your school work, your social work, your whatever you do during the day is affected. You can't do anything but to just lie in bed because they are very painful. Okay, you can't go for work, okay? That is uh, the dysmenorrhea, not, uh, you know, having pain and then you are here, you are even laughing, and so, <laughs> yeah, okay? So now, primary, primary dysmenorrhea is where, uh, after investigating, you can't find the cause, what is causing that uh, uh, pain during menses. There is no organic, organic cause, okay? You run through the investigations, no known cause. That's primary. It's idiopathic. Okay. The secondary is where there is a secondary cause. A cause is there. Okay. For instance, a very good example is what we call uh, adenomyosis. Okay. Adenomyosis is a form of endometriosis. Have we ever heard of endometriosis? Who knows what is endometriosis? So imagine having the endometrial tissue in ectopic areas outside the normal location. That endometrial tissue is found in the myometrium of the uterus. Now that one is called adenomyosis, that's a special name, adenomyosis. Or having an ectopic, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, ectopic endometrial tissue, maybe in plants, in the lungs, okay, yes, you can have uh, ectopic endometrial tissue in the lungs, you can have this tissue in the rectum, you can have this tissue in the bladder, okay, in the, what we call sacro, uh, uh, sacro ligament, sacro, um, what's the term, in the ligament around the uterus, Okay, 
so we can have this tissue embedding in those uh, ligaments, okay? Now, it means that this tissue will be responding to the hormones every time uh, uh, the menses are there. So they will also be breeding in those sites. So you are attending and then coughing blood at the same time. When the menses stop, you stop coughing blood, what we call hemoptysis. You are attending and you are urinating blood. The moment the menses stop, even the blood in urine stops. You are attending and you are having, you know, blood in stool. The moment the menses stop, the blood also in stool stops. Because they are responding to the cycle, wherever the tissue is. So, that tissue, if it's in the uterus, okay, myometrium rather, okay, it will be responding also. And so, they become very painful menses, they become painful. Uh, endometriosis is, is uh, quite a disturbing uh, condition. And actually, one may miss the diagnosis for several years, it can even take 10 to 12 years for, for it to be discovered that, oh, this is endometriosis. Okay, otherwise we'll just be managing as pelvic inflammatory disease, PIT, you know, and so on and so forth. You are missing out the real cause of uh, the problem. Yeah, so we can have such. Okay. Uh, some have attributed to having also fibroids in the uh, uterus uh, that when you are attending you may have some, some, some pain there and so on. Yeah, but uh, ideally fibroids are not painful. Fibroids are not painful. Yes, ma'am. Unless in pregnancy. Come again? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so there are ways to treat. <laughs> but we won't go into the details of how we treat, because that's another topic now. You'll you find that in your fifth year. Uh, which will be your what? Fourth year? Okay, I think. Uh, um, Yes, madam. It's 13.03, so we should be winding up now. Come again? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Spam cells also have a rise, but yes. Yeah, I can get. Which one? The stem cells? Where do they go? In the vagina. Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> like, like we mentioned, there are millions of uh, stem cells that are deposited in the vagina. But again, few end up entering the uterus, few end up going to the fallopian tubes, reaching the fallopian tubes. Majority of them remain in the vagina and in the endometrial cavity. Okay, so they, they die, they degenerate and uh, they become part of proteins, like I mentioned. Yeah, I think uh, there are so many questions. Uh, we call it. <laughs> Thank you very much.